Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode one of Whale Tales with me, Andrew Beluga Whale Sideman, here on DeucesCrack.com. Um, give you guys a quick overview of what this season's going to look like, and then um, we'll uh, proceed with the content. Um, I'm actually going to sit out from these tables while I sort of break this down, I think. Um, and uh, so the first thing that I, that I uh, should say is that to start off these, uh, these episodes coming up, Given that the name of this of the uh, series is Whale Tales, I'm gonna offer you guys a couple stories or a story each each uh, to start off with, sort of about my how I developed in poker, and then we're gonna go on and discuss sort of the content after that. But uh, so my, the story I'll start off with is um, how I got into poker in the first place. Um, it's sort of a little known th uh, thing publicly that I was like terrible at poker when I first started. I played in live games and I was always the big fish. I was degenerate. I accepted a loan one time. My friend would give me 50 bucks, and I had to pay him 50 bucks back plus, uh, what was it? It was that I, I took his 50 bucks, and I had to pay him like 75 back later, just so that I could play. And I I did it because it was like a terrible. I mean, obviously, it's a horrible deal for me, but um, I, I was uh, you know, overly emotional. I didn't think things through at all. I wasn't analytic. I hadn't yet sort of developed uh, pokerist into something that was a you know something that involved you know mental thinking. I was in all respects uh, a, probably a bad aggressive fish. Um, maybe maybe a bad pass, probably a bad passive fish actually. It was hard to remember exactly. But um, the story of how I got actually involved in poker in the first place was that I uh, I kept on losing to the same guy named Jason, uh, who is this little whiny punk <laughs> who uh, I couldn't imagine that this guy was better than me at anything. And so even though I was a pretty was an awful poker player, I was determined that I would not lose any more money to him. So that's how I actually got. I started searching the internet to try to find more about it. I discovered two plus two forums back in the day, and I started writing. And I, it took me a, over a, almost a year and a half of playing 25 no limit full ring and losing before I figured it out. So anybody who's who's sort of struggling with poker, it takes a while to get things figured out, unless you're some kind of like natural prodigy. And believe me, I'm not. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, there'll be more sort of stories about sort of key moments in my development as we go on. But that's the first one. Jason, by the way, ended up turning into a really nice guy and is now like one of my best friends. But doesn't change the fact that he's a whiny punk. Okay, so the basic deal with this uh, series is that I have been on a break from playing seriously, uh, from playing online poker seriously for a, a, a long time. Basically, the the quick rundown of what happened was I um, crushed high stakes on full tilt for a very very long time. And then I um, started playing 2550 heads up and went on a pretty brutal run, including playing against Jungle Man a lot, <laughs> which was, in retrospect, maybe not, not the greatest idea of all time, but still fun. Um, and, uh, and then for some reason after that, I couldn't win a pot for, you know, almost a year. And, uh, and so, you know, it was so tilting and frustrating, whatever, that I, I cashed out a bunch of money and I just left. And as some of you guys know who, who know me or have followed my blog and stuff like that, I've, uh, I've traveled pretty much everywhere. At this point, I've now hit, I, I count, you know, Antarctica as a continent that I've been to because I was very, very close when I was in Argentina. So I, even though I wasn't technically in um, Antarctica, I, I still count it and I hate cold places, so I don't really want to have to go anyway. <laughs> um, anyways, so part of the, the theme of this particular, um, uh, of this particular video series is going to be essentially shaking off the rust. Um, getting myself back mentally, getting, my, my, getting some of my skills back, um, and, uh, and sort of developing what I, what I can, um, can do uh, to see what I can, you know, try to make sure my game is up to snuff before I start moving up. And that's sort of the goal of this will be sort of to see how I'm at and, and whether I can move up in limits. This is something that I want to talk about really fast with the King-9 hand that I just played. We had a regular, uh, this condom boy, which is obviously great for, you know, talking about him, um, opens, and then a fish, uh, this guy clearly fish, he's sitting with, you know, 100 big blinds or less, uh, calls, um, and, oh, this is perfect, and, uh, 
And so that's sort of a perfect ideal spot to squeeze because the regular is going to fold all the time and the fish is going to call, which means I'm basically just getting heads up with the fish all the time or they're both folding. And if the regular does anything, he's probably going to re-raise, which I don't really care so much about because he's probably doing that with a pretty tight range anyway. So then you might say, well, Andrew, you just squeezed king nine very well. Why not squeeze queen eight here? Well, now the order is reversed. We have fish and then reg. I squeeze here, I get a call, and then I get another call, and now I'm out of position in a multiple pot with queen high, with queen eight offsuit, which is, you know, a little bit less than ideal. So then I might consider opening a here against the same guy that I threw bet down here um, with ace nine, but, I, you know, my, my guess from a game dynamic point of view is that this, this, someone like this is going to be a little knee jerky to, to respond. He doesn't want to get run over. He's going to be really likely to four bet slash pay off. Um, so I'm just not going to worry about it too much. Um, and that's going to be that. Okay, so one thing that you guys may notice, which is um, a uh, will seem bizarre to those of you guys who have followed my videos already, uh, is the fact that I am playing with stats. That's right. I have hold a manager now, <laughs> and I'm using it. However, I, I just you got the default the default arrangement on right now, and um, I uh, I only I'm looking at like some of the more basic, some of the more standard. Um, again, this would be a spot where I could consider three betting here, king four. But uh, again, I think people are probably likely to be knee jerky. And then we see this guy here, um, you know, the same guy aggro grab before three betting me here as I try to isolate this fish. Um, we're getting we'll get back to stats in a second. But uh, this is one of those things where most likely he is playing something badly here because the majority of his range should be wanting to flat and a lot of players screw this up so most likely unless he has something like i don't know king five suited or something like that that he you know is good but not quite good enough to flat um his his three betting range should be incredibly incredibly polarized there um and uh you know but it, it but just because it should be doesn't mean it is and i think a lot of the time he you know he takes something like you know king jack there and jacks it up and that's just a huge huge error um again one thing one other thing before i get into the stats um so this looks like what i was talking about before where this guy might be a fish here and this guy looks like he's a regular so this looks like it's a pretty good spot for me to squeeze um that might be too big i think that's good um Okay, um, so getting back to stats, I'm only going to. I, I I was convinced. I got a conversation about this, and I, I became convinced that knowing somebody's VPIP over a you know a significant number of hands um, is important and you know valuable to know. Um, knowing their preflop raise again uh, is a good indicator of their passivity and stuff like that. So in general, I have no problem. And this sort of is understandable to me that somebody would get a little bit. Uh, knee jerky here, um, even if he has aces or something like that, I mean, like, whatever, but um, this, this sort of general plan is still fine, which is, I'm trying to get uh, trying to get him to fold and him to call if he's a bad player, and that seems to be like it would be a pretty effective strategy. But again, um, you know, just shaking off the rust, getting back into things, seeing what happens. Um, okay. Where was I? hey -o, I was flopping the nuts. Hooray! <laughs> Um, and I'll open fours down here. Okay, so he checks to me here, and this is one of two things going on. This is either a guy who's got a hand like queen 10, that's going to you know, so-called induce action, but basically has no idea what's, what in the world's going on, or it's something that's just straight giving up, and there's basically no way I'm going to get action from it anyway, um, unless it somehow beats me, like say ace-king, I check, and a, 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 a queen spikes off or something like that. So I think it's just more likely he's got something like queen 10 that's going to pay it off than not. He could also have something like pocket fives, pocket fours, and the potential value that I would miss by checking back and hoping to let him spike um, is just not quite good enough for me um, to uh, to be a part of uh, betting there. Man, I'm picking up some dimes right now. Um, I'm going to bet the jacks for thin value here. Uh, this guy seems, you know, again, he hasn't rebought. Uh, he seems to have played generally pretty passively. Um, you know, if he raises, I can comfortably fold there, but I think more likely he's going to call me with something like queen 10 or, you know, two low spades or something. I mean, obviously he has a lot of aces as well, but against somebody like that, our value is better. We're better. Jesus, I'm getting a lot of hands. <laughs> our value is better uh, <clears throat> on the uh, on the flop than on later streets when draws can either hit or miss. Um, Interesting sort of thing with the, with the queen 10 suited here and with the jacks. We'll deal with the jacks in a second. Um... 
so and ace queen. Okay, so ace queen here. This this should be a pretty easy uh, squeeze for value given the presence of this fishy fishy guy over here, um, and the same aggro dude who was there before. Um, I think the queen ten suited and the jacks are a call. The jacks, if I was playing against someone that I knew a little bit better, that had more of a dynamic with, like say somebody who I thought would be likely to to three bet five bets all small pairs from there. Obviously, I'm gonna call this with ace queen, um, and we're flipping. Um, but uh. With the jacks, I, I don't know if he's going to shove all small pairs now, which makes calling a little bit of a better plan. Um, and it'll sort of be interesting to see what he does on this type of board, because this is the type of thing that if he's three betting, uh, if I have a, uh, if he has a depolarized range, um, he, he sort of connects with this board somewhat often, like he has king, queen, and ace, queen, and stuff like that. But if he has a polarized range, he's got all kinds of random low junk that, that don't have a lot of stuff on this board. And so, um, and he'll oftentimes give up with those hands. Um, once we take a call, um, and uh, that's actually a really interesting card because it's pretty unlikely for him to have king jack, or it's kind of hard for him to have king jack given the fact that we have all kinds of jacks. Um, obviously, we pick up some more equity ourselves with an open and straight draw. Um, you know, he, he's just sort of unlikely to bet. It's sort of hard. It again becomes difficult for him to bet again with something like king queen, uh, or even if he had like queen jack because it's just difficult to get value. Um, you know, it's just it might be a little bit thin on that turn card. So I think we can check back here. Um, and it's obviously it's hard for us to get value. Now the fact that he didn't bet the uh, the fact that he did did not bet the turn leads me to believe a few things. Number one, he's pro I mean I still think if he has ace queen or aces or kings, he's betting the turn. Um, and uh, if he um, so I think he's sort of unlikely to have those things. If he has an ace here, he's got ace x, and he, I wouldn't be surprised to see somebody play it kind of passively here. Um, and uh, and just check, but obviously I'm gonna check back because I can't bet for value and I can't bet as a bluff. So, be interesting to see what he has here. Okay, it's kind of surprising he didn't bet the turn, but again, not not super surprising. But here's so this is the interesting thing to know here. So I'll show you what I'll do here. Player notes: three bets, pol depolarized range from small blind. Okay. So now, in general, I'm gonna be way more inclined to be four betting against this guy than I am gonna be to flat preflop. And that's just going to make his life totally miserable. And just that one little note that we got the showdown with, you know, didn't cost us all that much. We played the hand probably close to correctly against his, his range overall, um, you know, with the exception of preflop where we didn't really know what was going on. Um, again, we don't know anything about this guy, and 9-10 suit is a pretty weak hand anyway, so we're just going to fold it. I was just talking the other day about how I get kind of sad when I have to fold something like queen-jack suited to a 3-bet because it's so fun-looking and it can make all kinds of straight flushes, but... But regardless, we can just get out of the way. Um, but uh, what I was going to uh, going to say is that that one little note, that one basically that ability to say, okay, this person, I've now seen what this person is doing. Because put it this way, he can't be three betting with both king queen and seven eight suited. Because if he is, he's three betting with everything. And if he's through betting with everything, he's basically going to be a bad, bad aggressive player because he just has too many hands in his range, and it's not going to be very, very difficult to play against him. Um, so this is going to be another interesting thing. I'm going to see bet this board because I think see betting is still pretty effective uh, at, this, at smaller stakes, but it'll be interesting to see what kind of range this person has here for for calling, um, for calling from the blinds. Now, one thing that I think is is sort of a critical piece to me coming back and playing. Uh, um, uh, to, to playing poker again is really, really emphasizing what is my opponent doing in all of these spots. Like, what is their, uh, what are their ranges actually looking like? I'm raising the king ten here to isolate this guy there, um, and uh, I'm gonna actually I'm gonna call the ace eight here because I think our equity does pretty well against this range, and he gives me a good price by making it smaller. Um, I think that's like the adjustment that probably in theory should be made against somebody like this, and then probably not to fold on this type of board. So the real question that gets developed here is whether or not the turn is a double barrel. Um, there's obviously a ton of draws going on. I actually don't think that he folds all that many um, better hands than I than I have. Like I think I could see him folding. Um, I'm gonna. It's against this guy over here. We've got image against him, so I'm gonna re-raise him. Um, oh boy, so many things happen at once, and that's a pretty good card for me because you know there's not that many fives in the deck, and its value range is still pretty small. Um, the only hand I could see him folding here that's better is like ace ten. I don't think he folds very many jacks here on the turn. Um, so I actually don't mind. I think that it's maybe a little bit underrated to take the uh, take the free card in those spots. Um, interesting. So many things happening at once right now. I've got the nuts all over the place. So we're gonna double barrel that for value. 
we're obviously going to fire out um, in this 3-bet pot here. And we'll check back here with our ace-8. Um, and yeah, so he wasn't going to fold that hand on the turn. It, it, there's just not that many better hands he folds on the turn. I'm actually going to check, consider check calling down here with my uh, with my ace-8. The nine's actually not a great card for me because that pairs a lot of things randomly. Um, but uh, I think that... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, if, if his range there is limited to, like, and he's only going for two barrels with, like, a king, a king and, you know, a good king and a five or something like that, then, like, at the end of the day, it's really, it really can't be that bad to, uh, um, interesting. So, um, so it, can't, it can't be that bad to, to check, check call down or at least think about it um, against an aggressive opponent. And this guy has so already four bit me once, and he seems like he's pretty aggressive. It's it's a little bit of a cooler that he he shows up with you know good top pair there, uh, but then again the the preflop play is definitely questionable. We'll talk about that stuff in the in the comments thread and all that stuff. So here's one thing where you would think okay maybe you should flat here because you know you have such crushing equity. Um, but my problem with flatting is I don't think he bluffs all that often when I call when I call the flop here. He might catch up with something like king queen, but that's still pretty unlikely. I think he's more likely to stack off with a lot of things that would you know play badly otherwise later, um, like you know for nines for example. Like if I call there with nines, there's a good chance he he checks back. Um, and uh, if he, that, that's a pretty big disaster for me if he raises and then checks back with nines on a later street, um, and then maybe somehow gets away on the river. So we, I, I'm going to talk like in the in the future of this session or in the future of this um, this series, I'm going to talk somewhat extensively about um, about how um, what's how, how am I going to phrase this? About basically slow playing. About about how to, when do we consider slowing down? And I'm gonna fold this ace eight because there's not a whole bunch, a whole lot of stuff of value going on over here uh, from these guys because they look like they're both sort of reggy regs. Um, and same thing with the queen five suited. Um, so I want, I want to quickly comment on the aces against his pocket nines there. Um, the only reason why I'm three betting with aces there is because we already have this image going on that he looks like he's just not a kind of guy who likes to fold. And I'm, I am making some very quick judgments. As you can see, we've only played, I put this guy's on, I want to say, you know, three of my four tables. And, you know, we've still played a, a total of 50 hands against him. So he's hardly somebody that we have a great read on. But what we have seen is he's, you know, he's been active. He's been raising, he's been three betting, he's been four betting. Um, and, uh, and sort of that level of activity implies to me somebody who's really not likely to fold. Now, honestly, against my actual range in that particular spot at that time against him, calling with nines is a huge, huge, huge image-based disaster. <laughs> Uh, especially if he's just going to stack off with them on any board where there's no overcards. Because the truth is that I'm just I'm betting for value against him there, given the dynamic right now, 100% of the time. And by the way, I doubt this guy's going to adjust fast enough, so I probably will continue to bet for value against him. Um, and by the way, if you're a Deuces Crack member, sorry, I'm just ragging on you right now. But, uh, I, I mean, it's one of those things where... Um, uh, being able to adjust your ranges based on image is something that you know higher stakes players do, and it's the reason why a lot of players sort of get stuck at one two is because you know they think, oh man, this guy squeezed me once, sque squeezed me twice. This guy's been, you know, he's been all up in my all up in my grill. I, you know, I, I double barreled him over here with the king ten. Um, I, I wonder if I, I could have made an argument for maybe uh, for maybe uh, the king ten hand went, went by pretty fast because I was playing a lot of things at once. I wonder if I can make an argument for uh, for checking the turn with King Ten. Let's take a look. This is another thing that you have to do when you're getting your game back. Is you have to sort of constantly be reevaluating your line, like uh, looking at last hand histories is I think the best way to learn uh, to learn what you're what you're doing correctly and incorrectly. I'm going to raise the eight nine studio because of this fish in the small blind. Um, so. You know, I suppose I could check there and give him a chance to fire, but the problem is I think that if he has Ace Ten. Ace X, he's more likely to call that than he is to, to bet himself. Even though the guy is pretty active, and we see him again three betting down there, um, we have a raise and a three bet here. We don't really really read on this guy. I think this guy's new. I don't think this guy's the same fish that was there earlier. Um, I'll double check on that though. Yeah, he's not. Um, the fish that was there earlier is, looks like it's gone. Um, so I think we just have to fold that, unfortunately. Um, and same thing with the ace three. Although we're getting deep, so it'll be close to starting time to just three bet the hell out of this guy here. But uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of players ask me about you know how do I pick on you know an individual reg? Like how do I go after you know one one reg? 
And uh, what I'm doing to this condom boy guy is kind of the idea of that. So now, without the same image with Ace King here against this Gnoble, Gn I can't even read it. <laughs> I'm actually gonna flat my Ace King here, um, and down here I'm gonna three bet my Ace King for just like the the cleanest value of all time. Um, and uh, so he checks back, so I'm just gonna go. Pop, I'm just gonna bet two streets here. Um, and I really think he's likely to four bet bluff, and I think he's likely to call me with worse hands. And uh, so far, I just haven't been bluffing this guy at all. You could make an argument that maybe my opening six seven suited there starts to get a little bit weak, given how often this guy's three betting me. But um, but I'll sort of be surprised to see uh, Condon Boy get out of the way here, unless this guy makes a big big play or something. Flatting. I, I could see him squeezing for for thin value here. Um, with like a lot of worse hands or re-squeezing rather, You're going for thin value against rip on back or whatever. Um, interesting. So I think actually I can make a small bet here uh, for thin value. I think if he has ace queen, he may be likely to uh, come along for one more street. But uh, um, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> um, but you know, even if he has like a like a smaller pair, like you know. Tens, jacks. I, I think he's unlikely to shove. And so, if my opponent's playing collar fold, that's actually not a bad thing for me to do. Um, to bet, uh, to bet small. If my opponent's playing collar fold because I've got equity. I've got six solid outs that you see. I'm sort of able to capitalize on. Betting bigger there and putting my opponent into a shove or fold spot is unnecessary. It doesn't accomplish anything. Um, and we sort of also get a nice little read from this on the, that this guy here, this rip on back guy, is kind of a fish. The only time that betting is king there is really, really bad is if our opponent only raises or folds. That that puts us into a terrible, terrible spot. In fact, I bet 22 there. That might have even have been too big. Um, you know, you don't want to bet so small that your opponent just, you know, somehow reads that as you're really weak and then decides to raise like you know tens there because you're so weak or something but even in this type of situation i just don't, I don't think that happens i think that um players you know abuse or misuse leverage originally players misuse leverage because they w would raise too big in spots where their opponent was already raised folding but i think one other sort of more nuanced spot that people misuse leverage is they um they bet too big when they have equity um, when force they, they force their opponent to a raise or full spot when they have equity. They basically don't have a full understanding of of when um, of when to play uh, of when to be polarized or when to be depolarized. When to make your opponent play raise or fold. When your when your opponent's gonna play call or fold. Those things should be inherently tied. Um, Queen Jack. Once upon a time, I said Queen Jack was a uh, um, a time to uh, flatten these things and I think that could be that's wrong with with decent players in the blinds um, that's from an old old video though so we'll see okay so against somebody who I thought was deep was they had a polarized range I think that this Queens here is a flat um, however against somebody with uh, what's already been seen as a depolarized range I think that we make a mistake if we don't if we don't format this for value um, because uh, against a depolarized range, queens he has a lot of hands that just have a lot of equity against queens, and that's not as good for us. He also has more more things that are likely to call or, or play play back at us if we raise. Um, now you might some of you guys might be saying, Andrew, he's a sixteen eight. This is why we have to ignore stats right now. A sixteen eight over twenty six hands means nothing. This particular sixteen eight has some kind of weak non nut hand for three betting. Um, you know, if it's yeah, now he's my stats updated. He's a nineteen twelve. Oh, now it's okay. Well, my stats will update later, and I'll probably be like a thirty two twenty five. <laughs> so, you know, don't just go off this. Oh man, this is such a tough spot with queens. Remember that. Really, truly, admit to yourself that those types of stats are in fact useless. Really, admit that to yourself. Okay, I think I'm actually going to three bet this. Uh, I'm definitely going to three bet this king three suited now. Um, it's a pretty good spot to squeeze. It's a good hand to squeeze with. Uh, this guy's got a wide range, and this guy probably is not trapping very often because I haven't been squeezing all that often. So I think it's a good spot for us to come over the top with a with a squeeze. Um, again, if we get called, we have a lot of equity. We're only you know it's one of those things where king three suited is like the ideal hand to be to be or this type of hand is like the ideal thing to be doing stuff with because it's basically neither polarized nor depolarized it has like um you know it has high card value it's got good equity but at the same time we don't really care if the other guy raises and we have to fold it's sort of just the best of all worlds 
It'll be interesting to see if he raises here, but here's the thing. A lot of players who are kind of weaker at these limits will call you with a lot of, um, with a lot of like, shooty connector, dry types of things. And because of that, um, we, uh, we can actually, and I would just, I would expect a shipping get called by draws here, or have him just fold here, like, a fair amount of the time. So that's what I'm gonna do. And if he shows up with King Jack, King Queen, Ace King, then that's just too bad. He flops his set, that's, you know, that's gonna be what that is. People who flop sets in three bet pots are gonna make money. Um, but, uh, the fact that he's calling pocket sevens there, which I think is potentially, uh, could be kind of a, a weak call given the sort of the weak implied odds he's got, um, and the fact that I'm gonna be pretty aggressive on a lot of overcard boards against him. Um, I'm gonna call with the fives and peel, uh, peel there. But uh, the one, the one problem with with calling with fives there, it's almost, it's really almost a fold. And, and I know it sounds crazy, but you just have to think about how much equity our opponent actually has in this kind of thing, where you know all kinds of his hands, his you know his range is is potentially strong you know, on all kinds of cards. And that, like right now on this seven, he's got all, he's got a lot of value combos here. Um, which is why I sort of like like to call with Ace King in those spots like before where I call that a position because I can check call that flop and be in the same spot and have a better sense later on to know what I'm dealing with um, from an information standpoint. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm sort of like I'm not. I think that actually, interestingly enough, that King three suited him where I, where I stacked off. The fact that he showed up with pocket sevens there um, means that the stack off was like a good thing to do. Um, because if he's showing up with pocket sevens there, um, then it's uh, it's sort of reasonable to assume that he could also be showing up with uh, you know eight nine suited or something. And if we look at that board again, um, we will see that something like eight nine suited on the flop has a maybe he has a gutter and a backdoor flush draw which decides to play back, or if he has like you know, say nine ten of diamonds or something like that on the flop. I bet you know it's sort of you see those these people raise stack off for those things a lot, and they're obviously in pretty bad equity shape. Okay, so here this is interesting. So this guy has been really aggressive at us, and uh, and but he three bets us and we're out of position. I think this is the kind of guy he's probably seen a lot of videos. He's probably sort of aware of what he's supposed to do in position and stuff like that. And I think he's pretty likely to have a polarized range here. If he's got kings, he, we're going to stack him anyway. But if he, uh, well, not anymore. Um, but this is the sort of thing where I think he's likely to fire here. Now, because of how, uh, because of like, um, all of the the stuff <laughs> on this board that could have equity that would play against us, and the fact that I think he's sort of unlikely to to bluff us a whole bunch later, um, I'm actually going to check ship this um, for value, obviously. Um, I just don't think he's super likely to bluff us again, and there's a lot of action killers, obviously, so I'd rather get the money in now before an action killer or a B card comes. And if he's got kings, he's got kings, and that's you know going to be the way it was anyway. But it's sort of it's sort of underrated how good it is to just call there because it's sort of there's basically very 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 few, if any, situations in which we're not getting it, getting it in against kings there. Um, and so I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be overly concerned. And that, that uh, seven here was for value. I think he's going to call him with a lot of ace tens and stuff like that, um, which unfortunately just got there. But um, hey -oh, but I re-got there. Um, and if he bets here, I think raising is too thin. Um, and I'm just going to fold my nine high to this guy who never folds. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think I think that against his... Against this guy's range, it's, so it would be very, very difficult to argue that four betting aces there is better than flatting. Um... Just because I think he's going to be, it's a different, you know, being out of position. Like if if uh, we we're in the blinds or something like that, or if he was in the blinds, um, he has king nine. So yeah, he had top pair there. Um, he's calling with king nine from the blinds against me. This is clearly just not a guy that wants to fold a lot of hands, um, and so our plan against him should be quite quite straightforward, I think. Um, and so far has been going pretty well actually, um, despite that we have been running kind of bad. Um, but we're not gonna we're not gonna worry so much about that, right, guys? Running bad is nothing. Anyways, um, so this is one other thing, sort of to note. I want to sort of talk about the the difference between some of the regs that that we're looking at. Um, I'm gonna put this somewhere better. Um, uh, mm, so this is interesting. 
We're at a table of all regs here, and I'm a little concerned about this this guy, you know, playing back at me over here. But by the same token, I'm 200 big blinds deep with this big blind, and I've got like the ideal type of hand for a big uh, deep situation. So I'm going to open it, and even though I know that the value of it's going to be a little bit decreased by the fact that this guy's just going to be hassling me, most of my value is going to be coming from there. Um, and then I think against a guy like this. We can get a fair amount of value here by betting and double barreling because I think this guy's the kind of guy who's likely to float us with like pocket sixes sometimes. Um, you know, just random things that, you know, are silly, but that he will do. Um, this guy's been playing, I mean, uh, this is one of those things. There's only been 15 hands, but the guy's been playing half of them, and I think he sort of seemed a little bit fishy. So this seems like a good spot for us to maybe uh, three bet for some thin value with our ace 10 here. I would I would expect to get called a lot out of position here um, by this guy, um, just given what I've seen so far from him. Now, I could be wrong here, but that's okay, because it's sort of like if he if he is, uh, Ace 10 sort of an interesting hand in this situation, because if he is the kind of guy who will call out of position and is kind of bad, then uh, thank you for ruining my example, dude. <laughs> um, obviously, you know. That's more likely than not to be the nuts, especially if we're if this guy's kind of fishy and this guy knows that. If this guy, if the guy we're isolating is kind of fishy and and this guy knows that he knows that we're value betting him, which means he's value betting a guy who's value betting, which means he's got the nuts. Um, hopefully everyone followed that. But anyway, Ace Ten's kind of interesting there because if the guy that we're three betting there is the kind of guy who calls out a position, then it's good because it's like a good hand that we can get value from. If he's, uh, I'm gonna fold the King Ten here. Um, if he's the kind of guy, I'm going to fold here with 5-8 suited because it's a little weak and this guy's squeezing. Um, if he's the kind of guy who is playing 4 better fold against us, it's actually also still probably fine because Ace-10 is probably just around that point of like the worst, the worst, you know, the best of the worst, the kinds of hands that, you know, we, we don't really feel great calling with, so we'd rather 3-bet. Um, so Ace-10 is actually kind of interesting that it's sort of it's sort of good on both accounts there. So now a lot of you guys know me as being like really, really, you know, crazy and laggy and all of this stuff. Um, watch how tight I'm going to get over here on this left table with this guy on my left. Um, I know I open under the gun, but I'm going to be more liberal to open under the gun with this deep guy here. But but from mid position and the cutoff and even the button, I'm going to be significantly tighter here, um, given the presence of that guy. Um, Ace King, could I raise and get value? Uh, this guy has a depolarized range, um, so normally if I was going to bluff him or something or play back at him, I would do that. But the fact that I crush his depolarized range and I'm really likely to have, like, if he pairs, I'm really likely to dominate him right now, um, would make flatting here better. And so it's sort of unlikely. I mean, obviously we've only seen the one hand, but it's sort of unlikely that he has, like, a bunch of hands that hit this board very hard. In fact, it's sort of very hard for him to have um, anything but missed overcards or big pairs here. And so I'm going to get a lot of action on an Acer King. He's going to slow down a lot um, without, you know, with overcards. And so um, I think we can flat that just fine. That, that's actually the nut bad card in the deck, <laughs> um, given my hand. That's, I think, the single worst thing that could have peeled off. Um, so we'll just cry silently about that. Because that's the sort of card that hits a lot of his, you know, he's got... He's got a lot of ace queens. He's got a lot of king queens. Obviously, if he has big pairs, he's still going. But he basically just has a lot of hands that that include, you know, a queen, and just got really, really psyched. Now, a lot of players would get sort of excited about their, you know, oh, I could flat this, you know, whatever. Um, but even if a like, best case scenario, he's got something like king jack or ace jack, he's still doing like, you know, reasonably well. I guess ace jack's not doing that well, but king jack's doing reasonably well against us. I think aces and nines. Oh, I forgot I ran out of time. Either way, I think it's sort of easy for us to overestimate our equity. Um, this guy's calling pretty lightly from the blinds. I think that I'm pretty likely to be able to bet my ace for value. But I'm running out of time because I'm talking too much. Oh, no. <laughs> um, be interesting to see what happens if he bets here. I think I think if he bets here, he's too likely to be going for thin value. Um, and now it's that 10 that makes it a little hard for me to be going for thin value. Uh, it makes, uh, it's a little harder for me to bet for value here, so... I'm really tempted to open this queen nine, but I think it's just a little bit light in mid position. If it was the cutoff, I would, because uh, of this fish limper. So I'm gonna check back and hope it's back a nine, um, and that's what that is. But uh, I would have, I would have probably tried to bet for the ace for thin value, because I think he has a seven, a six suited, eight seven suited stuff like that, um, which just gets maybe a little bit hard to get value on the turn. Um, and let's see, I'm gonna win the pot, so let's see what he had. 
because that will be interesting. Oh, I forgot to hold the manager will tell me. So you had ace five suited there. You know, it's likely he has ace six suited and ace seven suited a fair amount of the time as well. Um, I'm gonna still open, you know, cards that can make flushes and straights, but I'm min raising it now, given this guy's here. Um, just some sort of quick adjustments about playing against this guy. I wish he had a, a more PC uh, <laughs> screen name than Condom Boy, but you know, can't 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 get what you want all the time. It's like I, I was playing, uh, I played um, in the Australian um, uh, Heads Up tournament, tournament, the Aussie Millions, and. Uh, has this guy threw at me yet? I don't remember. No, it doesn't look like it. Um, yeah, I haven't been three bet yet. I'm just gonna fold. Um, and we'll give up on this board. A lot of people play aces, and a lot of people have a spade or two. Um, but no, I was playing against uh, Jono Karamalakis. I want to say his name is who's like he. You know, as this Australian tournament player, I was playing. I got him in the first round of this tournament, and uh, <laughs> his screen name is Monster Dong. <laughs> so, like, but he still uses it in public. Like, he's on like the cover of magazines, like Jonathan Monster Dong Caramelakis, and I'm always just like, wow, I'm really happy that I chose something that was just random and non-sexual when I created my screen name way back in the day. Uh, because I mean, obviously, no one ever expects they're going to be like really, really good or something, but like. Or you to know, make a bunch of money or something, but uh, <laughs> but I think it's funny that when people have these types of screen names, just no no planning. So if you're gonna make a new screen name, you know, come up with something PC because you never know if you're gonna hit it big. You'd like to have that that PC uh, element on your side. Um, yeah, again, stats are still too weak to be useless here. To use be useful here, we're a little deep, but I think maybe not quite deep enough to call here out of position with Jack Nine suited. Especially since it's one of those things where if you think that calling out of position here with like ace king, ace queen, ace jack is good because you're going to get a lot of action, then calling out of position with jack nine suited maybe isn't quite as good. Um, those things sort of can go side by side, hand in hand, together. Um, wonder how much I'm how I'm doing this session. Down two seventy six, down one fifty, up one sixty. Down 57. So, done, you know, a buy in. Life goes on. Um, I think my plan is to do two videos at 1 2, two videos at 2 4, two at 3 6, and two at 5 10, something like that. Um, but we will, we'll see how it, how it goes if, if my, uh, return is, a uh, less, less successful. Maybe I'll grind out smaller sticks for a little bit. But uh, I would I would expect that I have a pretty big edge um, in these games. Um, I want to actually talk a little bit more about the aces against king's hand here against him. Um, I want to discuss sort of a psychological thing that a point that Phil Galfon made. And again, this sort of thing where I've got two big cards, he's on the button, he makes give me a good price like the ace eight before I can probably call here because I'm doing pretty well against his range in general. Um, Something that, that Phil Galfon talked about is the mental reinforcement of winning pots that can make you feel good but distract you from the point of winning money. Um, and uh, this guy, this is the second time this guy's threw at me, but keep in mind the first time the guy threw at me, um, I four bet him, so I think he might be potentially could be less likely to three bet bluff me now. Obviously, I have a good hand to uh, to play back at him with, but I think I'm just going to fold this time, given the given the flow of how that whole thing went down. And again, it doesn't really bother me too much uh, to occasionally fold the best hand there because I, I've got to remember I'm playing against rages ranges. Um, so yeah, it's sort of unlikely here that he's going to. Yeah, this is actually a pretty good run out for me because it's sort of likely he's going to bluff this. You know, potentially could bluff this uh, or thin value this, but probably that he, he could bluff this ten and think that I don't have very many tens in my range. Um, and so, I mean, it's worth a shot. It's the only way I'm going to get action from eight six there. So you see there, he's opening eight six offshoot. So my equity is crushing his with queen ten there. Sort of people people have a tendency to underestimate their equity with a hand like queen ten, ace eight off stuff like that. That is actually pretty valuable. But anyway, getting back to this, people oftentimes just four bet their aces, or they four bet their ace king, or whatever, because they uh, 
because they like the feeling of winning the pot. They they remember the times that they that they bet, you know, they four bet their aces and the guys got kings and the guy ships and it's like hooray. And they sort of like the general feeling of when they four bet and the guy um um and the guy I'm gonna have to muck this ace nine. Another thing I think in, in blind versus blinds, at least for my guess would be people aren't bluffing that much anymore. Um but once again, if it becomes a problem, we'll deal with it when it becomes a problem. Um the uh People have have this tendency to just you know, just auto ship, um, and uh, because both because they remember the times they want to stack, and because of because of the mental reinforcement, they just sort of feel good when the guy folds. But they don't they're not thinking that it's really 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 bad if the guy folds his king seven offsuit when he's going to stack off if he hits a pair of kings, you know, when he's going to bluff on a you know jack four three board. You can offer out a bluff C bet, um, you know, which in in a three bet pod is is a lot of money, and so um, we sort of had this sort of idea of oh man, it's we it's really hard playing out of position, blah blah blah. Um, it's not that hard to play out of position when you have pocket aces. It's not that hard to play out of position when you have ace king or pocket kings. Um, it the reason when it gets hard is when your equity gets bad compared to theirs. So it would be like if I open jacks and this guy here who I've already seen to three bet me with a depolarized range. If um, if he three bets me and I've got jacks, I can't flat there because he's just got a lot of things that have really good equity against me, which is why I four bet the queens um, against him before. Um, you know, things that have like a lot of overcards or a lot of like you know have, things have a lot of value. Um, and uh, wow, this guy is just quadding out of control right now. <laughs> um, but. Uh, but it's you know it's not it's not necessarily just because it feels nice or just because it's like more exciting to to re-raise and see what happens or re-raise and get it in. It's just there's just very there's no possible way that it could be the best thing to do against somebody who's got a polarized range who folds to a lot of your four bets, um, and uh, you know, in general, like is going to play perfectly against your aggression. We have to remember that. Oh, and sort of the last thing about this, people say, oh, you know, I'm also raising to collect dead money. Well, dead money is totally uh, is totally tied to how often the guy uh, bluffs and how often the guy folds. So, for example, if we have aces there, and we think that this guy never bluffs after we call out a position, then, um, sure, maybe we should forbid, because if he never bluffs, he's going to play perfectly. If he never, like, value owns himself either, he never, you know, he's going to play perfectly. But the simple truth, that's just unlikely. Interesting. So we're now starting to see sort of that these, you know, one two games are taking on the character of being like a little push body. Um and against either a polarized or a depolarized range, it's better for me to be four betting this. Um we're a little deep, so I'll make it a little bit bigger. Um and we will see what happens. Um Basically, if you have a hand that has good equity, that sort of should be inclined you to, you know, be in your range of hands to play back. If he ships here, obviously we're gonna have to fold. Um, I don't think we will have a, a lot of five bet bluffing ranges, 150, 100, and more than that. Big blinds deep. Um, let me fold the queen jack here. Um, you know, if he flats, that's not the worst thing in the world uh, because three still have good equity. Like flopping a set is, you know, still very, very plausible and obviously not readable in any way by him. Um, and so, you know, is it the best thing in the world I could have to four bet with? Um, okay, this is interesting though. Um, this is very interesting. I find that a lot of the things that somebody would three bet me before with in a different situation, I'm gonna end up folding this actually. A lot of uh, things that people would three bet sort of lightly, like this guy is like a pretty active light three better. A lot of those things opt to flat here, given the presence of the multi-way pot. So when he comes after me with a with a three bet here, he's got a depolarized range with a lot of things for value, and I think a lot of his sort of thinner things um, actually you know, again become calls. So I'd be really surprised to see him fold here. I think he's really likely to have a big hand, and as you can see, he does have you know a couple of ace, a couple of ace queens there, which would have been nice, obviously, for me to ship my deuces because I would have won. But by the same token, um, if we're thinking about playing against ranges, um, probably you know we can see right there that he has a lot of value things there. Um, he probably squeezes tens. 
Um, maybe he even squeezes nines, which would be a big disaster for us if we're trying to squeeze tens there. Um, and so, uh, and so I think that 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 is a right fold against his range. And now I pick up aces over there, which is um, obviously amazing because of how splashy everything's been getting. Um, and so I flatted the ace-king before, but he actually played passively on an ace-king high board. So I'm a little concerned he's not going to play super aggressively, which if he's not going to play super aggressively, then I have to basically, my hand is basically forced. I have to go for value now um, and uh, and hope that we can, you know, get some love. But what we should be seeing here is that when I'm attacking other people, I'm going for value much more often because of how push-body things are getting. You see this person just auto-snap shoves his king-jack, um, and... Uh, there's no way. <laughs> it's the same the second time we've seen this happen today, where the first time I had aces against his king, this guy's king jack. The first time I had aces against his pocket nines. This time I have aces against his king jack, um, and uh, I mean he says he says misclick, um, but you know, I'm not. I don't know. <laughs> you know, a lot of people try to save face by talking about misclicks, but I just I just don't know if that's a misclick because just of how splashy these games have been already. Um, so I mean, it's one of those things where it's I, I can just expect to get, um, you know, expect to get some kind of decent value um, by playing just a little bit, playing bluffing a little bit less. You know, it's just common sense, just not to bluff when nobody's folding, um, and uh, you know, just basically focus on when people are playing back at you. Hold your own. Don't get tilted. Don't get spazzy. Just you know, stay cool, stay calm, generally play tight, you know, and then when you're going to play back at somebody when it's appropriate, which, you know, we've had a couple times today where we need to play back at somebody, um, you do it appropriately, you do it with hands that have equity, um, and you just remember that, you know, if you don't really feel great bluffing someone because they never fold, that's fine, um, you just now, you're just going to have to get a hand, because you can't, you know, if somebody never folds, then you just have to have a better hand than them, and that's the only way that's going to work. Um, I think isolating the 10-9 here is a little bit too tight, uh, or a little bit too too loose, rather, or 10-6 offsuit, rather. Um, this guy's just a little short, and these guys obviously are playing ultra splashy as well. Um, so a lot of these things here, like I would be inclined to be squeezing both the, or to three bet the king-5 suited here against a lot of people, and I'd be inclined to uh, to squeeze with my queen-10 off here against a lot of people. Um, but uh, given the presence of these guys here, I'm just I'm just not going to, because they're just not folding. <laughs> Um, they're they're going to play correctly too often with their a6 when they flat and they get all crazy. Um, obviously, it would be nice to have top two pair, but you can't always get what you want, can you? So what's interesting is actually people the, the aggression gets toned down. Uh, so here's like, this is a great thing again here. I'm going to flat here. Um, with my, um, this is actually tight because these games are so push body that it might be a better idea to raise here. But I think it's better to flat here and trap, given the presence of this guy and all these things. So I think I am, I think I am more inclined to flat here and trap. I think this guy's really likely to come over top for a squeeze. And I think you know, worst case scenario is I take a flop with aces. I'm not going to feel that uncomfortable. If he has ace king here, he's going to be able to. He's going to, you know, if he's got king jack here, I just stacked him. You know what I mean? Um, so now let's do a quick little, let's quickly check what the pot's going to look like here. If I call this bet, it'll be uh, 85 bucks in the pot with 160 behind. Um, I think I get the most value here by flatting and shoving over top of the river, I think. Um, and this could definitely be him going for a, uh, um, a river check call given that these draws miss. But, uh, I think, you know, he can definitely... We only lose value here from ace-king and if he folds ace-king, which is sort of questionable. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like... it's People always... Re again, talking about mental reinforcement. People always remember these times when, oh, you know, I stacked ace-king all in pre with pocket aces and, like, you know, that means that it was good. Well, there's just, like... The first thing to remember is the fact that you've got two aces makes it a little bit less likely that he has, you know, ace king. And that if this guy's opening a reasonable range from from mid position or the cutoff, that it's, 
you know, it's just sort of unlikely that he's got ace king relative to all the other things that he could have. And then we consider, like, you know, the sort of the thing that put it over the top was how squeezy and, and push body these other guys behind had been. So you know, that definitely adds a lot of value to calling with aces there. And again, that's not a, that's something that's not mentally reinforced by feeling good about, you know, that hand. Obviously, I would feel better about that hand if I, you know, if this guy would have squeezed or if, you know, um, that guy would have had king queen and potted the river and called a shove. Um, but, uh, but you know, we have to remember that it's not necessarily about what happens right now. It's about all the things that could happen that we're playing. Every time we play, we're playing a combination of a whole bunch of, of different scenarios, um, that all could happen, you know, that all, all do happen. And that's what we're, you know, that's what we've got to be thinking about, not what's happening this particular time. And the push bot <laughs> syndrome returns to the upper table. Um, so my min raise there is just definitely proving to be the correct play with this, these guys in the blinds. Um, this guy's now, he's guy's three bet me a few times now. Um, I'm raising the 9-7 suited for value here. A lot of people think, well, that's pretty crazy value, but like, uh, he's just going to fold on a lot of flops. Um, and I'm just going to outplay him, most likely. And so, um, just essentially collecting dead money. You know, I, I pre-flop, maybe I was making a thin bluff. But the sort of value of that thin bluff or whatever um, gets sort of rolled into the the value of being able to play this pot against him. Uh, and now, obviously, I'm going to check fold because very plausible he was limping a bunch of things with aces in them. It's sort of unlikely that he's flirting me with things that don't have me beat right now. Um, I'm calling the 7-6 suit here. I'm using some positional protection, which I've talked about in the past, um, which is basically, I'm just going to make it 5 here. Um, <laughs> someone chat with me. Uh, positional protection means it's sort of un less less likely that someone's going to squeeze there because of how. Uh... Thanks, bro. Um, I'm going to re-raise this because we're deep. And uh, deep stacked, I'm probably going to be able to just own on this guy. The deeper you get, obviously, the more skill advantage becomes into a. Uh... <laughs> comes into play, so uh, he's also probably opening a pretty wide range. Through betting a polarized range from the blinds is not inherently a bad thing. I'm betting the 7-6 for, for thin value. I think he's a good chance he check calls with ace high or something. Um, so this would be, be another interesting spot to um, uh, to check back, because it's sort of unlikely he's going to call with that many worse hands, but um. I think he. I think I actually can bluff him off of some things. Like he could have like pocket sixes, pocket fours that you know have a bunch of equity and stuff like that. Um, that I don't love having them hang around. So I go to check call on this flop. Um, I think I'm gonna go for like one more street here because I think he he's a fish. I think it's likely he can have still you know be check calling me again with like especially some ace high that has spades now or ace four, ace five, something like that. So the river is gonna be too thin to bet. Um, but uh, I think a lot of players make a mistake there of saying, you know, oh, okay, I, I bet and got check called, but, you know, I, I was betting for value because I thought ace high would be involved. And then he check calls, and then being like, oh, now I'm probably beat. Well, the whole point of betting in the first place was because we thought that he was likely to have ace high and calls with. So we can see we got two streets of value here from, from ace king, which I think a lot of players only end up getting one there. Um, or they wait to the river, and he finds a way to fold on the river, which I think is, you know, if you think about the way a fish thinks... Um, He's sort of more likely to to get value on the turn, than, or you're more likely to get value on the turn than the river because one of the big things that's going on in his mind is he wants to see what's going to happen. You know, he wants to see what cards are coming. So the jack is actually a totally awful card for him because a big range of his check calling there, or at least a big range of stuff that I was going to get a lot of money from, is, was ace jack. But um, I still think I have the best hand often enough that, and I'm going to get, excuse me, and I'm going to get called by worse hands often enough. Um, you know, jack x of diamonds. Uh, ace ten, stuff like that. That he's gonna he's gonna peel. Um, you know he'll peel the uh, the turn with you know a fair amount of of other you know other worse aces and potential draws. Um, raising here to me is like, <laughs> of course he does, is just like it has ace jack just written all 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 over it. So we're really deep. An interesting idea here because we have the ace of spades would be to call, and obviously if we, you know, if he checks, then we can check back, but uh, to try to rep um, the uh, spade flush if he bets and come over the top um, on some rivers, um, and uh, 
That's kind of an interesting one, actually. Um, we can't rep an eight at all, um, and the eight kind of you know hurts our set combos or whatever. But uh, be interesting to see if he if he has ace jack here. I mean, if he if he fires this river, we have to fold clearly. Um, it's sort of unlikely that he has very many things now that were value that were you know straight bluffing the uh, the the turn. And this is this is not a great card for us to uh, to come over the top um, and ship. Um, because we can't rep diamonds, or like he he can have diamonds, whereas if we we have spades, it's very it's impossible for him to have spades basically, um, and you know obviously it'd be very plausible for us to have spades. Um, I think I, he, a lot of players will just bet their ace jack here anyway, and I think that's a mistake. I think it's a mistake to bet, bet ace jack here because we're, like if we're good, we're going to be folding ace queen here, um, and so it's sort of very tough for him to have like right right now his bet sizing is so plausible. He's he's betting for thin value here. Or he's betting for pseudo thin value here. Either way, he's got you know he thinks I've got something that I'm going to call with, but you know the mere fact that he's doing that means I'm going to raise or fold. I don't think that he folds many of his value hands here, so I'm just going to fold myself. Um, but uh, as I said when it came down, that jack is like the not bad card for us, but that's okay. Okay, so now we'll go returning to value betting our aggro boy over here. Um, and I think he's likely to have, you know, worse kings, king 10, maybe king 9, maybe, you know, he's definitely going to have queen, jack, queen 10, ace, queen, probably three of ace, queen, we have jack 10, jack 9, ace 10, you know, all kinds of things that we can just get straight value from without problems, so, I'm looking for multiple streaks there against him. Um, and actually, this might come close to doing it for, uh, this session. Well, well, let's, well, we picked up queens. Let's play queens, and then we'll call it, we'll play queens, and then we'll call it a day, huh? Um, because queens are great. And we're going to return to our basic ordinary strategy of just three-betting this guy for value and watching as he doesn't fold. <laughs> um, which, you know, it's like pretty straight. <laughs> now, if this guy four-bets, then we have a situation. Keep in mind, by the way, that he folded once to my format, but he's shown depolarized stuff every time. Um, and he flats. It's okay. I think he, this guy's likely to ship here. Um, well, that's about as good as that is going to get. Um, we're deep, so I feel compelled that I have to bet. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think that a lot of the value here from betting is going to come from him either hero calling or, uh, or somehow floating, which again is like just not that likely. Um, once he, I think, uh, once he calls me, I think I have to continue trying to go for a thin value here and try to set up a way to maybe get stacks in. Um, if I bet 62 there, I have to overbet the river. I'm going to have to overbet the river anyway. Um, this guy donks, that's interesting. Um, and that's obviously a pretty bad card for us. So yeah, I'm gonna bet again. Hopefully he's got like pocket eights, that would be sweet. Um, it's one of those things where it's like, it's just gonna be really hard to get value, but I can't slow play, because this guy doesn't seem like he's that aggressive, like I think he'd be inclined to check back a lot of stuff and try to get a showdown. Um, He's going to be bluff catching regardless, and I'd like to put him in a spot where, like, you know, he's, uh, bluff catching. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to get full stacks in, but, um, that's okay. I can fold to this, my draw here, because my draw just went to shit. Um, If he has something like eights, he's going to shift the river anyway. He can't have a queen, obviously. Um, I think he has you know, a good chance he has aces or kings. Um, and uh, let's see what let's see what we end up with there. It'll be interesting to see. Come on, hold the manager. Show me what he had. He had aces. Um, it's going to be just a little bit difficult to. Uh, to get a lot of value from uh, 
you know, to get stacks in there just because we're so deep. Um, but uh, I think that's about as good as we're going to be able to get um, against him. You could make an argument for shipping, but I think it's just too likely that, I mean, aces and tens there are very similar. It's sort of unlikely we're ever going to take that line with kings, we're representing a queen or nothing. Now, what's kind of silly is because we're value betting this guy, which should be clear on his element, that we always have a value hand, you know, coming to the flop, and then a lot of those hands are going to be things like ace, queen, king, queen, stuff like that, um, that we're going for value again, before against, against condom boy. And so, uh, and so, I laugh every time I say that. Um, oh, I forgot to sit up. Um, and, uh, and so because of that, I, uh, we have to fold that. Um, uh, because of that, I think he should, you know, he should be very much inclined to fold, um, you know, probably the river. I mean, maybe you could make it, you know, maybe you could make an argument for the turn, but, you know, at least definitely fold the river because I'm, if I was value betting him, I've got to be value betting. So if I'm value betting him, then I'm value betting over there, like, I can, you know, I have at least a queen. Um, now, it's hard to put someone on just, you know, just a queen, you know, you have to have a queen or nothing else, but think about the action. It's not like I'm bluffing this guy. If you're paying attention, there's just no way that I'm bluffing this guy, and so... Uh, oh my god, this guy's running terrible right now. <laughs> this, this is just brutal. <laughs> um, anyway, um, that should uh, that should do it for this episode of Whale Tales. I will uh, have another one for you guys next week. Um, one two looks like it went okay, and uh, probably do one more at one two, and then move up two four. But um, hope you guys have uh, hope you guys have enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for watching. For DeucesCrack.com, this has been Andrew Beluga Whale Simon, and I will see you guys next week.